presentations we have for you today are Dr. David Shaw from Agas Electronic Materials and Chasmtech, who will be presenting on innovations in transparent flexible lighting. Jack Herring from Jiva Materials, who will be providing us with an update on the Recollect project for recyclable PCBs. And Zach Dismukes from Bowman Analytics, who will be telling us all about the new XRF developments that enhance measurement and throughput for ENIG and NEPEG finishes. Okay, so to our first speaker, which wasn't originally the order we'd planned this in, so thank you, Jack, for stepping up to the plate. Um, no I'm pleased to be able to introduce Jack Herring from Jiva Materials. Jack is the CEO and founder of Jiva. He invented the solid board material during his MA in design products at the Royal College of Art. Jack has been instrument, instrumental in raising a significant amount of funding to allow for the development of this recyclable PCB material, including obtaining an Innovate UK grant for the Recollect project. The ICT is one of the dissemination partners for the Recollect project for recyclable PCB, so we're very pleased to have Jack here today to provide us with an update on how the project is moving forward. Jack, if you can share your screen, please, it's, it's over to you. That's great. Thank you, Emma. Hi everyone. Uh, would you like me to turn my camera off, Emma? Or up to you. Okay, I'll leave it running. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is that showing up? Okay. Yeah. It is. Looks good. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm Jack Herring. As Emma said, I'm the CEO of Jiva, um, and I, I'm also the project manager of the uh, Recollects project, um, and we're making circuit boards recyclable with the support of Innovate UK. So I'll just give you a short uh, project summary uh, and a bit about the scope of the project. So uh, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, e-waste is the fastest growing waste stream in the world at this point um, and 54 million tonnes of e-waste uh, was generated in 2019. Um, about 18 billion square metres of PCBs were produced in 2020. Um, so they are a big contributor to that, uh, that amount of e-waste, uh, about 8% is estimated. Um, but only about 17% of the e-waste is recycled responsibly. Um, and much of this consists of small domestic equipment, uh, about 32% is estimated by um, the, the UN as reported in the Global E-Waste Monitor in 2020. Um, and while some PCBs are recycled, um, these are usually the, the higher value ones with, with good gold, silver, palladium contents. Um, even some of those slip through in about 9 million euros worth of precious metals, including gold, silver and palladium, um, is lost every year. So the purpose of the Recollect project, uh, the main focus is to develop an alternative way of managing end of life circuit boards by removing the typical fiberglass and epoxy PCBs from the supply chain. The primary target is to demonstrate how feasible it is um, to produce a PCB substrate in high enough volumes to have the impact uh, required um, and also maintain comparative performance levels to um, existing market leading materials like SEM1 and FR4. And the secondary target is to ensure that the substrate is compatible with the existing fabrication processes um, used in the PCB industry. Um, the ones in question are the aqueous uh, processes, um, particularly etching and electroplating. So the partners within a project, uh, we are the lead partner, Jiva, um, and we are leading um, the spec and the development of the PCB substrate uh, based on uh, Soliboard, which I'll expand upon um, in a minute. Um, but we are working with Coventive Composites who are producing this material on our behalf and we are then converting uh, the laminates into working circuit boards. Um, and we're lucky enough to work with the ICT who help us with disseminating uh, any projects, uh, any um, updates that come as a result of that project. So uh, the backbone of this Recollect uh, project is Soliboard. Um, and typically, as you will know, PCBs are usually made of fiberglass and epoxy resin. Um, and when they are recycled, they are incinerated um, in order to recover the precious metals. Uh, but we've developed Soliboard uh, that allows PCBs to be recycled in a much cleaner way. Uh, so Soliboard PCBs will be non-toxic, recyclable, and fully biodegradable. Um, and we, we are offering, we're offering a solution um, which is produced using natural fibers as opposed to glass fibers. 
So the substrate itself can also be dissolved in hot water. And this allows you to remove the natural fibers, compost them and recover the components uh, for more efficient and more economic uh, recycling. So just a breakdown of the manufacturing process, we take the natural fibers, uh, we, we're currently using flax, but we are looking at other alternatives. These are impregnated with a polymer and a flame retardant, much like FR4 is. Um, and then it's just a typical um, layup process and thermo pressing process, um, which is led by our partners, Conventive Composites. Um, and then we get the laminates and process it and produce PCBs. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> so here you can see a soluble PCB, which has been dissolved in hot water. Um, and this allows us to therefore avoid that very energy intensive recycling process, which is usually used of incineration and shredding uh, and allows us to achieve a much higher yield of precious metal recovery. So we're acting in the supply chain as PCB a laminate manufacturer. Um, looking to supply European domestic appliances um, and the process would be that one of our PCBs or high numbers of our PCBs would be removed from products. Here you can see a washing machine as an example um, via circular uh, take back schemes um, and then they could be recycled using our novel water based recycling process which we are developing outside of this project. So a big impact is that a solid board PCB has about a 60% lower carbon footprint compared to an FR4 PCB. Um, a lot of this comes from carbon savings as a result of the, the lower density of our material. It's about one kilo lighter per square meter. Um, and just as an example, if solid board was used within 1% of all of the European domestic appliances, about 100 tonnes of plastic could also be eradicated. So the carbon footprint of Soliboard is about 7.1 kilos uh, of CO2 um, and FR4 is about 17.7 kilos of CO2. Um, and in terms of the plastic reduction, we're able to remove about 620 grams per square meter um, compared to the FR4 equivalent. So this is just a, a nice cheesy picture. Um, we, we've had some good news recently um, in terms of traction, we placed second in the Postcode Lottery's Green Challenge, uh, which is one of the biggest sort of circular economy sustainability focused competitions. Um, and that allowed us to receive an extra 200,000 euros on top of our funding for, from Innovate UK to develop, to develop this material and um, get it to market. So it's allowing us to speed up our development increase our speed to market, optimize our supply chains, increase working capital, etc. So in terms of the development, um, we are now lucky enough to have a lab in Waterlooville in Hampshire, where we have a, a processing area. Um, the support from the Green Challenge has allowed us to produce small quantities of PCBs in house and also engage in some internal testing. We're also developing our water based uh, PCB recycling process. Um, which will allow our customers to benefit from a circular supply chain. So um, in terms of printed electronics, while it's typically more compatible with flexible substrates, um, it's also compatible with Soliboard. Uh, the fact that Soliboard is also thermoplastic as opposed to the thermoset FR4 equivalent means that it is potentially moldable, providing the ability to um, print electronics onto non-standard topographies. Um, and as with all printed electronics, this is mainly focusing on surface mount technology applications. So uh, the surface finish and fiber orientation is key to achieving good results with printed electronics. Um, the main reason is if the surface is not smooth, then that can sometimes uh, result in breaks on the printed circuitry, um, which is not ideal, obviously. So um, we've now done a lot of work to improve our fiber orientation, as you can see on the picture on the right here, and remove some of the, the bubbling, which can cause imperfections on the surface. So uh, we're very happy with the results as, um, as supported by uh, Conventive Composites in this project. And the development there has allowed us uh, to produce some printed circuit boards using uh, printed electronics. 
Uh, this has been uh, helped by Print Electronics Limited in, in Tamworth, um, and we've now been able to produce a small quantity of these PCBs, which are based on an Arduino. This is a microcontroller, which is very commonly used in the um, in the maker space uh, industry. Um, but this has been supplied to a, a very big and very exciting potential customer who I, I can't disclose at this moment. Uh, so we're also compatible with typical copper etching processes. Um, we are able to produce copper clad laminates using our material. Um, the copper is bonded to the surface of solid board with um, a, a, a thin uh, layer of adhesive. Uh, we're aware that in, with FR4 the epoxy is typically not fully cured and that's how you bond the copper to the surface but uh, we are developing ways uh, to, to match that level of technology with our material and substitute our polymer for the epoxy in, in existing circuit boards. So we're also developing through hole connectivity um, outside of the Recollect project as well. Uh, in terms of Drilling and routing, uh, these are very important processes in, in PCB fabrication and we've now uh, got to a point where we are very happy, happy with the, uh, the quality of holes that we can produce. Um, the process has been optimised to make sure that we have very clean holes with um, acceptable levels of swarf uh, production, as you can see in the top left picture here. Um, and we've also been able to complete the routing on the copper uh, clad laminate version of solid board in the bottom right hand corner there. So uh, we've also been developing a woven variation of solid board as opposed to the um, unidirectional uh, material which you've seen up until now. So this is more in line with the formulation of a, a material which would be used in, in FR4. Um, so substituting the unidirectional fibres which means the fibres are all running in one direction with a weave will also help us to reduce costs um, as well as achieve the XY mechanical performances that are required within the industry. Um, so we've now successfully produced some, uh, some PCBs using industry standard um, subtractive fabrication processes. Um, and we've also used some of these boards uh, to, to test our recycling of the woven variation of our material, which have also gone uh, very well. So key progress so far, uh, we've established some parameters in regards to the drilling and routing. Uh, we have produced some prototypes for uh, based on the Arduino design, uh, where we have discovered how, just how important surface topography is. And we were aware of this before, but it's becoming more and more apparent. Um, the, Copper has been successfully etched off of our material and we've demonstrated the resistance that is required um, to the wet fabrication processes typically used in the industry. Uh, we've printed and cured solder mask and eye dent uh, via UV processes, which avoids us um, having to use high uh, thermal excursion processes, which also reduces the carbon footprint in the manufacturing process. And we've gained a good amount of traction with white goods, LED lighting, and computer peripherals uh, customers. So um, the UD variation of SolidBoard has been submitted for preliminary third-party testing um, without conditioning. I will add that caveat there. Um, the remaining tests here, which you can see on the right-hand side, which are empty, are due to be completed in Q3 of 2021. Um, and these tests will be repeated on the, uh, the woven variants of SolidBoard. Um, with conditions testing uh, to follow that. So, but it is important to consider that SolidBoard is setting a completely new standard for recyclable PCB substrates. So it is expected to be situated somewhere in between SEM1 and FR4 in terms of um, properties. So um, processing guidelines are going to be very important in terms of working with OEMs and uh, PCB brokers and fabricators. Uh, our material is slightly different, so we need to make sure that everyone understands how to work with it and how to get the best properties out of it. Uh, so by Q3 2021, we hope to have that completed as well as a, a fully comprehensive uh, MSDS. Um, and then we are looking forward to uh, submitting our material to UL um, for approval and reliability testing um, in Q4 of this year. 
uh, we've achieved the same um, FR uh, rating as FR4, which is UL94 uh, V0, which is great. Um, we have very similar mechanical properties to um, SEM1 um, and one very, one very promising uh, property in terms of electrical um, capability is the fact that we are able to match the CTI of um, FR4, which is, is very exciting. So in terms of next steps in the project, uh, we would like to continue the development of the woven variant of the material uh, using jute as opposed to the flax, which we've been working on up until now. Uh, we'd like to maintain and improve upon our, our high quality surface finish, which is required for um, optimization within the printed electronics world. Uh, we're also looking to build upon our drilling and routing trials by looking at v-scoring and optimizing those parameters. Uh, we're also actively searching for more applications of uh, print electronics that we can use in our material um, and we would also uh, like to have those processing guidelines uh, finalized by Q3 this year to um, support our OEMs and third parties who will be working with our material. So um, thank you for the opportunity and uh, with the support of all of our partners I do very much believe that Soliboard can spark a movement towards green electronics. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end and thank you for listening. Thanks and thank you Jack. It's really good to see how the project's actually progressing um, and here at ICT we're very happy to be able to provide the recollection team with a way of disseminating that information so thank you. Um, if you have any questions for Jack please pop them in the chat uh, function to me um, and then I'll be asking those questions at the end um, of all our speakers. Okay, uh, so to our next speaker, uh, Dr. David Shaw from AGAS Electronic Materials. It's great to welcome David back for a second presentation in the ICT webinar series. Uh, Dr. Shaw is the business manager for AGAS's semiconductor division, which also encompasses the printed electronic materials. David's knowledge base and research background ranges from semiconductors, lithography to printed electronics and electrochemistry. His focus is now in the semiconductor and printed electronics space. He's also been involved in a number of UK and EU research projects, including the currently active Horizon 2020 Mature Life project. It's the transparent, flexible lighting sector that David will be talking to us about today in his presentation entitled Innovations in Transparent, Flexible Lighting. David, if you could share your screen and begin your presentation, please. Brilliant. Hi, thanks Thank for you. the uh, introduction. Is, uh, is that coming through? It certainly is, yes. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay, well, thanks all for uh, attending the meeting and, and thanks, Emma, for the introduction. <clears throat> uh, in, in the presentation, this is a part of a webinar series. There's already been uh, a couple of them. So for the people who weren't present in the previous webinars, I'll uh, give a few uh, <clears throat> details from those on, on building up the materials before uh, a quick discussion of the, the application focus of this uh, of today. So the materials we're talking about today are uh, alternatives to ITO, Indium Tin Oxide Technologies. Um, so ITO being the industry standard for many, many decades on both glass and flexible substrates uh, for transparent conducting systems. Now on flexible substrates, it does present a lot of difficulties with flexibility, formability, uh, some transparency, conductivity issues with that combination on plastic, as well as then issues with um, costly production systems. So what we're looking at here is new alternative technologies that can take advantage of not being subject to these uh, negative factors for flexible applications and instead offering a, uh, a next step forward all those kind of applications. <clears throat> now, in terms of pre-existing alternatives to ITO, uh, various ones have been investigated over the years. Uh, you have PDOT, which is a conductive polymer material, uh, and there's also silver nanowires, metal mesh structures. Now, these have all sh shown some level of capability, but they, they all still have a lot of limit limitations, which have prevented them from really gaining large amounts of traction against uh, ITO technologies. 
Uh, of the materials within the range we're, we're discussing today, there are the Cygnus inks, which are a replacement for the PDOT materials, um, which drastically improve on, on things such as the environmental stability factor and reducing the blue color tinge of PDOT. Uh, but the key focus is the agent hybrid materials. So these are the materials that we're looking at as an alternative to ITO on flexible substrates and the uh, applications and, and possibilities they can open up in these spaces. <clears throat> so this is a part of the core structure of this hybrid material. Uh, it involves a combination of carbon nanotubes and silver nano wires on, on a uh, polymer substrate. <clears throat> and there's two different aspects to look at here when you compare the agent material with ITO materials. Uh, so there's the raw materials cost, Currently, the agent materials is slightly more uh, expensive in that realm. However, because of the patterning route that is open to the agent materials, you can drastically decrease your production patterning costs. So overall offering a better performance and a more affordable solution for flexible substrates. <clears throat> in terms of the process, it, uh, essentially follows two, two simple steps, um, a screen printing process with a, a quick dry, and then a very mild etch rinse process. <clears throat> and this is a far simpler route than uh, the likes of ITO, which involves laser ablation processes for patterning. Um, but that also with this being a screen printing process and then a mild etch process, these are technologies that a lot of PCB manufacturers and printer electronics manufacturers already have in-house. So it further applications without a large capital cost or new equipment. <clears throat> and the materials itself so just on the left hand side of the screen with the silver nanowire right hand side with a metal mesh base in the, the blue square and then the mild etch process removes all of the non patterned areas this uh, is how we can perform our patterning whilst generating the hybrid structure the ink that goes down acts as um, an etch mask however it is not removed it remains as a functional part of the this hybrid material following this. And as you can see from, from the figures there, you get some very good visible light transmission percentages combined with some very low sheet resistance values for these, this material. So there's been Maybe just, your sound seems to be breaking up. And we keep losing you every so often. I don't know whether there's a connection issue. Apologies, I, I think my uh, internet connection is a bit unstable at the moment. Oh, okay, no worries, we'll continue on. And if it gets too bad, we'll, we'll find a way of dealing with it. Okay. <clears throat> so in terms of application areas, um, the first presentation in the series went into a lot more detail on the transparent heaters, the second one on the transparent antennas. So I'll just make a quick mention of those for those who weren't present previously, and then we'll be moving on to the uh, lighting films. <clears throat> in terms of the uh, transparent heaters, in the spaces these could be used in, but a, a key one of interest is the automotive sector. sector. So with the development of um, automotive vehicles that are fully autonomous and utilization of lighting systems, and if we look at the, the headlights, for instance, uh, industry data has shown that over the last several years, these have been progressively moving towards LED materials. Uh, these are far more energy efficient, offer, offer good luminosity. However, the issue that they then face that previous technologies didn't is they are very low, um, they have very low heat output. So that can lead to fogging and misting of the headlight windows, which can be a difficulty. Now we can apply the transparent heater technology to this, this uh, issue. And with 
very low power systems prevent any fogging and heating and <clears throat> create a system which offers more energy efficiency, offers a weight reduction. And so with that rate, weight reduction and energy efficiency, we're using lower fuel consumption uh, and being better for the environment as, as well as the technology improvements and reduce fuel consumption for, for the, the, use, the end customer as well. <clears throat> In terms of things like the, the front windscreen and the back windscreen, traditionally, these utilize wire-based systems. As you can see from the thermal image, these give very non-uniform heating distributions. So this can, uh, as we will we'll have all seen in our cars, give very localized areas that uh, demisting and de-icing begins to take effect rather than the whole windscreen together, as well as the vis visible wires, <clears throat> which are then affected by regulatory requirements on these. Uh, and then finally, the single point of failure. So if there's a one particular point that is uh, broken within the conductive track, then the whole system starts to fail. In opposition to this, the, the ITO um, alternatives, the chasm agent materials, offer far more uniform heating distribution, very rapid and effective heating process. Uh, and again, this utilization of a, a lower weight system that can also be. Uh, integrated into existing multi-layer windscreen structures rather than trying to inset the wires within. Uh, for these heating applications, there are also some demonstrator kits that, that are available that um, can allow people to almost like try before you, you begin a, a more full-scale trial using the material yourself. So there's a few different entry points there. Moving on from this, we have the transparent antennas application. Uh, so there's, there's a, a range of different systems these, these can be used for, as is listed on the screen, 5G, IoT, TV signals, as well as shielding. Um, so the, if we look at the image on the right in particular, these are three different antennas that were uh, all of matching design. The one on the left is copper plating. The one in the middle is silver ink printing. And the one on the right is the chasm uh, transparent hybrid film structure with that, that green dial just switching the input antenna. Uh, and all three of those had a completely clear TV signal coming in or receiving, and there was no change in the quality of the image coming through, going from one antenna system to another. Uh, and then, <clears throat> We have other aspects such as the RF shielding, which can also be utilized for um, phone, phone applications for protection as well as other systems. Uh, but likewise, then you can also utilize this technology for 5G transparent antennas that you could apply to say uh, a window. Um, with the, the advent of 5G, we will be needing a more widespread use of antenna technologies to, to fully support that system. So this is giving us a route to that, that uh, structure. <clears throat> now, moving into the, the sort of core focus here today uh, is lighting applications. So we can see from, from market data that uh, LED, transparent LED films, and active images, these are all very, highly active areas of interest for digital signage and advertising currently. So the things like shop front facing, um, potentially advertising images put onto the side of buses, trains uh, and the like. <clears throat> Although there are also a wide range of other areas as well. So hospitality, workplace, trade shows. And as you can see, there, there's a wider list on the screen there. Now the, these images being very colorful, being able to have some, some motion, some activity, all help with the aesthetic and, uh, and help to draw in customers to the shops that, that utilize these technologies. In terms of digital signage then, we can see some market data here. So on, on the bottom left, you can see the growing uh, total market globally 
year on year, um, which shows no sign of slowing down currently. Uh, and in terms of the distribution, this is now uh, taking a very large leap forward for it being based on LED technology primarily, as opposed to LCD or projection for a single application. And again, this is only set to increase, which is where we can utilize some of these um, lighting applications. <clears throat> and with the, the signage market currently being about $15 billion, uh, and again, expected to keep increasing, it certainly seems like a, a good industry to uh, be active in. <clears throat> the LED display systems, currently about 500,000 meters of um, meter squared of display area, $6 billion. Uh, these are spread across a range of different pixel pitch applications. But again, we're seeing growth for the, the digital market overall in all of these applications year on year. <clears throat> With the different pixel requirements being reflected in the um, application space or whether something is more of a internal company functional application, or if you're looking at more public facing aesthetic, where you're looking to try and drive business into try a footfall into a business with these uh, display technologies. <clears throat> now, we can see here some uh, of the conventional air quotes transparent LED systems. So these involve LED strips. You can see in the uh, bottom left image, a range of different strip designs and, and LED densities. These can be very uh, heavy systems with the uh, mechanical supports that are required for this, as well as not really truly giving a transparent image with the, the strip architecture that is built into these. So th this is the kind of obstacles we're looking at as presenting a difficulty for further development of uh, digital signage utilizing pre-existing LED-based LED technologies. However, this is where the, the hybrid materials <clears throat> can really offer the, the next step forward for these applications. So you, we can see here a couple of images. <clears throat> and this utilizes the patient hybrid material. As we can see, there are no visible connections between the lighting points, the LEDs, and these can be standard or micro LEDs mounted onto the, the polymer sheet. The connections are all uh, part of the hybrid material pattern to form tracks between these LEDs, <clears throat> but offering us a lot of advantages in terms of the environmental stability, the flexibility, transparency. And again, you know, a, a consistent point we're seeing for a lot of these applications as well is a lightweight option for, for the development of these technologies. <clears throat> and in terms of where these end up sitting, these can be utilized laminated between glass or applied onto glass and plastic. And there are already you know, a, quite a few companies that are expanding their, their activities um, or have been expanding their activities over the last couple of years into uh, aesthetic transparent lighting, but trying to make use of incumbent LED strip technologies. Um, uh, that are, are certainly interested to see where, where this technology could potentially take them and, and how it might develop their uh, current product portfolio. <clears throat> but again, the, in terms of the processing and patterning and use of these materials, these are all essentially up for anyone that can, um, can really take that in-house and, and provide those services. So then just a quick summary on, on uh, some of these areas. This is a new hybrid technology offering a solution to the issues of vital and flexible substrates. It offers a, a large scale manufacturing route that a lot of PCB and printed electronics manufacturers will have with in, uh, already in place and standard processing technologies. And it offers access to a wide range of new markets with 
product application and customer diversification capabilities. <clears throat> so again, we're looking at the potential opportunities for various PCB manufacturers, print electronics manufacturers, to be able to take up this technology, utilize it in-house, develop um, their own product base, customer base, uh, and really expand their product portfolio, portfolio even further. Um, this won't be replacing any of the pre-existing technologies that, uh, that you'll be more familiar with, with PCB for development um, and production, but it is really working to support uh, a wider capability of, of portfolio beyond that. <clears throat> and so mindful of uh, potential network issues, I'll um, bring the presentation to, to a close there. And thanks for listening. Thanks, David. All the great connection issues came good at the end, so no, that was really great. Thank you for that. Um, certainly another interesting presentation. It appears this is, say, an important technology for our industry to consider. So just a quick reminder, everyone, if you've got any questions for any of our speakers, David, Jack, um, or our next presenter, Zach, then just use the chat function, and then I'll put those questions to the presenters at the end of today. Okay, um, so uh, last but not least, um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Zach Dismukes, uh, Global Product Manager with Bowman Analytics. Zach is based in sunny Southern California um, and has been with Bowman for over 10 years now. Zach holds a master's in chemistry and started working with XRF for bulk material composition and thin film thickness analysis whilst with Oxford Instruments in 2007. So has many years of experience with XR, the XRF technique and I'm looking forward to him sharing, with this, sharing it with us now. Zach, you're ready to go. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Emma. Can you all see my screen and hear me okay? We can. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thanks again, Emma. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And uh, like she said, hello from sunny Southern California here. And um, yes, so I work for Bowman Analytics and they are based in Chicago, Illinois. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about our XRF technology and how it pertains to the printed circuit board world in particular for uh, some new developments that we've made to focus on Enig and Inipig and all basically all thin metal finishes that uh, that are applied to the printed circuit boards. So uh, real quickly, um, XRF, for those of you that are not familiar with it, it's an analytical technique that's used to measure uh, elemental analysis basically is what we're doing. We're more or less, we're, we're counting atoms and I'll get into that a little bit more, but uh, for the printed circuit board world in particular, the XRF technology is applied to measuring thin films uh, such as the thin gold, palladium, uh, electroless nickel, things like immersion silver, immersion tin, uh, basically any metallic elements uh, we can measure. Uh, we can also measure uh, composition. So in something like a solder uh, uh, type of a, a coating like a tin lead, uh, we can measure the, the tin lead composition as well as the, uh, the, the plating thickness. So it's got a lot of different different uses, but in general, we are measuring metallic elements. It, it, it isn't uh, capable of measuring organic type coatings, um, but, but basically anything metallic from aluminum to uranium, if you're looking at the periodic table, uh, we're capable of, of measuring those, those elements. Um, and and the, the thicknesses that we're working with, they're really good for printed circuit boards because we can measure uh, you know, sub nanometers, even down to the angstrom level, uh, up to uh, microns of, of coating thickness. And it really just, the thickness range, I get asked this a lot, you know, how thick can you measure? How thin can you measure? Uh, it really is uh, dependent upon the elements. Uh, but again, in general, we're talking, uh, you know, single nanometers up to uh, tens of microns. Um, just real quickly, you know, uh, what are x-rays? Uh, X-rays are a form of electromagnetic radiation, and um, it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, years ago, I, I kind of had a moment of clarity where someone was teaching me, uh, you know, about the the wave particle duality of of electromagnetic radiation, and it's it's such a strange phenomenon to try to try to wrap your head around. And 
And uh, if you're like me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a visual learner. So I, if I can't see something, then it's really hard for me to understand. But, but basically, x-rays are of the size uh, com comparable to uh, the actual atomic spacing of, of the electrons uh, that, are, that are whizzing around an, an atom's nucleus. And, and it's interesting because that's really important because x-rays are capable because of their size of interacting with the inner shell electrons. And that's really what allows us to, to do this technique, this spectroscopic technique of x-ray fluorescence, because basically what happens is you have these x-rays uh, irradiating a sample, and they actually have that, that size capability of interacting with those electrons and actually ejecting an inner shell electron. And then what ends up happening is you have neighboring electrons that just that, that then want to get uh, into that spot, that, that void that was created by that ejected electron. And uh, they want to get closer to the nucleus. They're attracted and they want to get to that more stable state. So they very, very quickly uh, will, will uh, uh, fight one another, if you will, to get into that spot. And, and whichever one gets there first uh, is now in that, that more stable state. And what ends up happening is that uh, the, the, the energy must be conserved. Uh, that electron that was further out is now closer to the nucleus. It's in this more stable state. And what ends up happening is it emits an X-ray uh, based upon the, the difference in energy between those two electron shells. And, and because atoms are defined by their elemental structure, that's always at a very particular energy. We call it a characteristic x-ray. So we can predict based upon the, the element atomic number um, where that energy level is going to be. Every single atom has its own distinct characteristic energy. And so we know where to look, if you will, on the, uh, the, the, the spectrum of energy where we're uh, actually collecting the, um, uh, these, these, these x-rays. So it's sort of, we put a, a wide band of x-rays onto the sample and very singular x-rays come back off the sample that are defined by the elements. So that, that, that's the, the fundamental uh, way that this technology works. Um, so the, the IPC, which is the, the international committee that uh, defines the standards for printed circuit boards and kind of de de defines the, the methods uh, for best practice. Uh, about four years ago, they came out with a a revision to the uh, the ENIG um, uh, specification, and of course that's gold over electroless nickel on you know uh, the the final finish on the uh, printed circuit boards. And they they it was interesting for my world in XRF because they actually called out a very specific requirement for uh, the gauge capability of the XRF instruments, and basically. You, you had to, to comply with this new standard, you have to be able to prove that your XRF instrument is capable of meeting uh, a certain level of precision, basically. So I've got some terms CG and CGK here, won't get too, too thick in the weeds on, on these, but basically it, it's, it's a statistical gauge requirement that you, you basically measure a sample 30 times minimum and your machine has to be able to, uh, to meet these specifications here. And, and basically what it comes down to is you, you need a very stable XRF machine and you need to be able to figure out what test time is required to meet these, uh, these specifications. And what we've done at Bowman is try to uh, uh, improve our instruments to minimize that test time because you don't wanna be uh, testing your sample all day long and you've got other things to do. And, and also the, the, this new spec, it, it calls out how many different uh, locations on the board you need to measure based upon the lot size and things of that nature. So it, it, it's, it's, um, it's a pretty uh, in-depth specification, but this is kind of the crux of it as far as our, our XRF technology. We're trying to, to meet these, um, these requirements and we're trying to minimize the test time to do so. And Bowman has developed uh, instruments that, that are guaranteed to meet these, these requirements. And I'll show you uh, some of the reasons uh, that, that have allowed us, allowed us to do that. 
Uh, some of the new developments we've done over the past few years is a big one is in the detectors. Um, we have worked with some of the detector companies uh, that have been in business for a long time, well-respected companies that, that have, we've kind of partnered up with to develop some uh, detection technology that allows us to, to capture as many of those x-rays as possible. And uh, I've got a, a couple more slides on that. Uh, we've also uh, developed some uh, interesting ways to be able to focus the x-ray beam. You know, all these electronic PCBs, uh, everything electronic related is getting smaller. So we have to have a very, very small, uh, well-focused x-ray beam to get on very small pads or, or, or wire bonds or, you know, any type of, of small circuitry. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, we have uh, uh, the ability to choose uh, different x-ray tube targets for the best sensitivity based on the, uh, the elements that you're trying to measure. And then we've tried to make our software uh, easy to use and automated in, in a, a way that uh, minimizes any operator error and just basically uh, maximizes efficiency. Um, historically, the detection technology was not uh, a, a solid state based system. Um, for those of you familiar with XRF, you might have heard of, of the detectors called gas filled proportional counter detectors or, or prop counters in the industry jargon we use. Uh, and they were, they were a gas based uh, detection system, very unstable. Uh, any change in humidity or temperature would fluctuate the, uh, the, 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 the gas molecules and the uh, the electronics, and it had very, very poor resolution. So if you see on the on the little graph there, that's a that's a typical spectrum that we collect with those different elements emitting those uh, characteristic X-rays. And this is a stainless steel. It's got iron, uh, chrome, and nickel peaks. Uh, the little black line there would represent that old prop counter detector, just a big blob of a spectrum. No, no very good. No, no resolution between those those elements. And you see the blue, which is uh, our, our silicon pin diode detector. And then the red is our silicon drift detector or SDD. So it's just an improvement on the, uh, the pin detector. But basically we only use at Bowman the, uh, the solid state detectors. And then you get uh, very good sta stability, uh, long life, uh, good separation of elements, and just, just overall the best, best performance for, for thin film analysis. Um, here are just some, uh, some, some statistical results for uh, uh, ENIG, the, the gold and the, the electroless nickel, um, showing the, the silicon pin diode versus the, the SDD detector. And again, I know I'm throwing around some terms you, you all might not, not be familiar with, but uh, just to kind of give you an idea of the difference between the detectors that we offer, uh, the, the SDD is definitely the best performing and it's going to uh, give you the best statistical results at the shortest test time. So it's, it's really perfect for things like ENIG and INAPIG, um, some of these really very thin film uh, metal finishes. Um, we can focus the x-ray beam using polycapillary optics. Um, again, I won't get too, too deep into this, but just know that we can basically focus our x-ray beam down to a 7.5 micron spot size and maximizing the efficiency of those x-rays. Um, the next slide here kind of shows you how we focus these. Uh, on the left uh, of the diagram, you see a, a collimator, which is typically used to focus the x-ray beams. Basically, it's just an aperture that only allows the x-rays that fit through the small hole to get to the sample. And it's just not very efficient because the x-rays that can't fit through there just get absor absorbed by the collimator plate. Whereas on the right, we have a, a polycapillary optic system that's attached to the x-ray tube exit window. And it actually uh, focuses the beams using a total internal reflection to a very, very small spot on the sample. So again, with, with, with the, the always decreasing size of electronic uh, components, um, the, the polycapillary optics are becoming very, very important to certain customers. Uh, this graph here shows the difference in uh, tube targets. Again, I know it's kind of a complicated graph, but just know that different x-ray tube targets um, have different sensitivity for whatever elements that you're looking at. So we can choose the x-ray tube target based upon our customer's applications. 
Um, we use a, a laser to actually focus our x-rays on the sample, and that minimizes uh, any, any errors. So it's very, very consistent um, to, to, because you always want to be at a very consistent uh, uh, height or working distance from the, the x-ray tube to your sample. So we've got this, uh, this laser focus system, and we actually have an auto focus system that you just, with one click, it, it automatically moves the laser to the perfect position, and uh, you know you're always going to be consistent, and you're going to get the most accurate results. And then we have a pattern recognition feature. So you see a little quick little video here where you teach uh, the, the, the software what your, your actual um, feature looks like, and then you can set up uh, an, an XYZ program that will hit multiple points and any uh, adjustments that are needed uh, are automatically done with the pa pattern recognition to uh, to get right in the center of the feature that you're trying to measure so basically again it's just, we're minimizing any uh, operator error and just trying to uh, maximize the, the the throughput and the automation of our uh, our system and you can set up a uh, an xyz program in a, a linear grid pattern uh, random um, you can set up datum reference points to where uh, you can store a program and then when you put in a board, uh, if it's always the same uh, patterns on the board, you can have it automatically go to the right places and then the datum points will uh, uh, account for any um, you know, difference in the way that the, the board is laid on the stage. So again, with that and the, the pattern recognition, you can really, uh, really automate and make sure that you're hitting the, the exact right spots every single time. And then uh, finally, all the data on our uh, machines are stored. Uh, again, any of you all that are familiar with XRFs, uh, the older models, um, you know, if you click somewhere on the screen, uh, your results are, are automatically deleted. So uh, with improved, you know, PC technology, uh, we've been able to, uh, to create a database that automatically stores every single uh, measurement. And then you can export the data in any, any fashion you'd like in a CSV file, text file, automatic uh, report generation. So basically all the data is stored automatically and it's, uh, it's able to be exported in uh, basically any, any uh, manner that you like. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you all very much for listening. Excellent, thank you, Zach. It's very interesting to see the benefits of using XRF in this way. My previous experience was limited to using it for evaluating components as part of the Roche directive. Um, so it's interesting to see it for another application. Okay, uh, so now time for a panel discussion. Um, if you've got any questions, so not too late, please put them in the chat to me. Um, I, if our speakers would like to put their cameras on. Um, I know Dave's got a problem with his, so we'll just have Dave on audio. Um, but if the other presenters would like to put cameras on, that'll be good, we can see you. Okay, my first question is for Jack. Um, you mentioned the recycling process. Um, I was just wondering what this actually would look like on a commercial level. Yeah, sure. So the pictures in the presentation were uh, just very small scale. Um, so on a commercial level, it would look like um, PCBs would be collected from a concentrated waste stream like um, satellite TV boxes, for example, uh, where you have to send them back at the end of your contract or something like that. Um, they would then be collected into a very concentrated waste stream, um, immersed in hot water just below boiling point, um, because our material has been engineered to only break down at, at high temperatures. Um, so uh, we do get questions about moisture and uh, and, and whether we are vulnerable to humidity and things like that. So, um, but we are making sure that we're engineering, engineering the material to be um, as resilient to those um, environments as possible. So, um, and then with some agitation and natural fibers and the layers of the laminates would uh, separate with the uh, natural fibers can then either be reused in applications um, such as the automotive industry where there are actually set quotas and specific requirements for natural fiber content in cars so um, an example is the parcel shell for the, the the lining of the doors and they all have materials like flax um, in them so 
Uh, but in a worst case scenario, the natural fibers can then be composted. Uh, the wastewater is non-toxic and the polymer um, that we are using is eaten by microbes as well. Um, and uh, the, the, the flame retardant we are using is also non-toxic. So um, the solder would need to be removed from the electronic components that we recover from CCL, subtractive uh, technology PCBs, but then we're looking at using, uh, we're still looking at using um, the, the most economic ways of processing these recovered uh, components. So, um, and we're also looking at whether you do actually have to take the components, completely shred them down or melt them down as is done within the existing recycling process. Um, because some components are, are very resilient to, to heat and water and that's, that's research which is ongoing um, outside of the Recollect project. So, um, and one thing I will also say is that the 60% the carbon footprint reduction I mentioned um, is also based on the typical shredding um, slash incineration recycling process. So. We would expect that when we have developed the um, the, the water-based uh, novel recycling process, that this would decrease the carbon footprint of a, a solid board PCB even further. Thanks, Jack. It's, fasc like said, it's fascinating. We look forward to a presentation just on recycling the way it's going there. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, question for David. Um, what companies looking to utilise your materials need to perform um, all of the developmental work for integrating the technology into their capabilities, capabilities or would there be a route for supporting the adoption of this new technology within the user applications? Uh, thanks for the question. So there, there would certainly be uh, a route there. So with, with ourselves and CASM, there is some scope for supplying some uh, pre-patterned structures for, for some initial testing, uh, but we have a structure in place called uh, the re referred to as the PIP screen, uh, PIP scheme or preferred integration partner. Uh, so these are essentially um, research and innovation houses that have experience using the, the CASM materials and the in-house capabilities to perform the development process. So we'd be then working with the PIP and the company or customer that would like to be uh, utilizing these technologies in their, their applications to develop the process for them and then that can be transferred when they want to go to a full production scale process. Excellent, thank you. So it's very interesting technology. Um, you can see the industry kind of taking this on board and, and running with it. Um, Final questions, we're, we're kind of already just about to run over, but for Zach, I've um, had a question from one of the participants. Can XRF measure the degree of corrosion as defined by IPC 4552 for ENIG? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, we're, we're all, we can't, um, we can't measure the corrosion and I know the, 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 the nickel, the black nickel uh, corrosion is uh, is another call out in that new specification, and unfortunately, as far as I know, that is simply uh, or or only a visual inspection that you have to look at on a microscope and then compare, uh, you know, the the amount of pixels of corrosion. I, I don't fully understand it, and I, I hear gripes about it all the time. <laughs> so I know it's I know it's an issue. Uh, but unfortunately, we're only measuring the, uh, you know, the, the, the plating thickness and the composition of the actual uh, elements present. We can't measure the, the degree of corrosion, unfortunately. <laughs> Good old IPC standards. <laughs> I'm sorry, Brian, go on. No, no, I'm just saying that's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay, um, we've just gone over time, so I'll, I'll call it... Um, a day there but if anyone has any more questions I'm sure all of our speakers will be very happy to have you reach out to them directly um, and answer any questions you have